you. Thank you. Thank you, James, for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about flourishing in the 21st century. When we consider flourishing in the 21st century, and we think of all the challenges that we're going to face as a species over the next 100 years, I think sometimes we forget about the key player in this drama. And that key player is ourselves. And we shouldn't forget that we're actually an ape. And we walked out of a forest a few million years ago. And we went on this marvelous trajectory to become what we are today. But there's a serious question here, which is, are we biologically able to deal with the amazing changes that we're about to face over the next century or so? Now, you know what those challenges are. A lot of them are in the news. So I'll just mention a few. Climate change, clearly uh, quite dramatic. Whether it's man-made or not is really irrelevant to this discussion. We are going to have to adapt to a planet where the small part that we can inhabit changes more rapidly than it's ever done before. We're going to have to work out a better way of achieving an equitable share of food distribution across the planet to avoid poverty. We have to do the same with water. And all this is going on while our population is increasing from 7.5 billion to 9 billion. And yet the odd thing about this is the standard of living is going up as we're managing to improve um, the um, environment that people are living in. And further, health care is getting better. And my clock has disappeared from the screen. <laughs> Just so they know. So healthcare is getting better. So this 9 billion, particularly in the West, is actually an aging population. And with that comes all kinds of other problems. We have problems uh, with medical treatment of an aging population. We're going to see more obesity. We're going to see more diabetes. We're going to see more cancer. Uh, we're going to see more um, degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. These are all things we have to deal with. And these are called non-communicable diseases which is good. We don't pass them on from one to another. But there's another bunch of diseases out there which are even more interesting, and they're called the infectious diseases. And these come from pathogens, pathogens like viruses and bacteria. So let's take bacteria. One of the worrying things is that the bacteria that we've been able to control over the last decades using numerous uh, very good antibiotics are becoming resistant. Now, why are they becoming resistant to our medicines? What is it that the bacteria know that we don't? And what can we do about this? Well, let's consider that point. So Fleming found penicillin in 1928. By 1944, the American government had 2.2 million doses of penicillin available for the D-Day landings. In that one act, they saved thousands of lives, thousands of lives on both sides of the conflict. And since then, in exactly 70 years, governments, Pharmaceutical companies and scientists and the community in general have striven to get these diseases under control and done a fantastic job. The health of the population from what used to be terrible diseases have largely disappeared. We can concentrate people in cities at densities we could never do before. They're predicting that Lagos by 2050 will have a population of approximately 40 million people. This is an extraordinary achievement. And yet, these bacteria now are becoming resistant. So why is that? How is this happening? Well, the answer is evolution, and the answer is Darwinian evolution. Because in that 70 years, with a bacteria that reproduces about once every 30 minutes, those bacteria have gone through two million generations. In the Western world, we have gone through maybe three or four as human beings. So whereas the bacteria has had the opportunity to adapt itself quite rapidly to these antibiotics and to select subpopulations which are resistant, we haven't. Our evolution is much slower because our generation time is much slower. So by Darwinian principles, is there anything biologically we can do to adapt ourselves to what's going to be a very dynamic and interesting century? So let's stop and think about Darwinian evolution just for a moment. Now, there's something wrong with Darwinian evolution. It's not that his theory's wrong. It's not that it doesn't work. It's been a terribly powerful synthesis that's allowed us to establish a bedrock for modern biology. And indeed, the concepts permeate our society. We kind of think in a Darwinian way. The problem with Darwin's evolution is it's unbelievably depressing. And this is because it's got no point. It's not going anywhere. It could go forwards, it could go backwards. Who knows what it's going to do? It's immoral, amoral, I beg your pardon. It has no function whatsoever. So what do we do with that concept? 
There's no reason, for example, a priori, why it should benefit any species. There's no reason why we, as mankind, should survive any more than anything else. In fact, if you look at the fossil record, what you'll see is that large animals tend to go extinct. And we're a large animal, which doesn't bode terribly well for the future. In fact, if you look at the life forms that really profit from evolution, guess who they are? It's bacteria. They do marvelously well. Oh, and the other one that does quite well, by the way, is the cockroach. It hasn't changed in about 200 million years. We, on the other hand, have been around for 50,000. So in evolutionary terms, we're not even out of the crib. So is there any way we can see that we might biologically be able to cope with these dramatic changes that are coming up? And to do that, I'd like to go back and look at some of the earlier proponents of evolutionary theory, and particularly um, about this man Lamarck. He was a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He worked in France at the turn of the 19th uh, sorry, the 18th, 19th century, published his main work in 1809. So it's about 200 years ago. He was the first person to really come up with a hard um, concept of evolution. He wasn't the first person to think about this. I'll mention two others. One was a Scotsman called James Burnett. He was a lord, actually. And the other one was Erasmus Darwin, Darwin's grandfather. They both began to play with the idea that species could change. In fact, James Burnett is credited with being the first person to claim that man might be related to a monkey. It's not clear, however, whether he was using that point in an evolutionary context or whether he was being insulting about a colleague of his who he didn't like. And it seems the latter was maybe more likely. It was Lamarck who first said that species change, and he called it the um, transformation of species. They had, and they, he thought that this process would be linear. So you'd start off with a simple form, it would become complex, and then it would become perfect. And every species did this. Every species had its own line. Now, we know that's probably not likely to be the case. But one of the problems with that part of Lamarck's theory was perfection in his idea was to be a member of the Academy in Paris. You can imagine how well that went down in Britain. We were in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. So a French perfection was something that the British really didn't understand. And you could argue that it's maybe still a problem nowadays. So, the other problem, though, with poor Lamarck was he fell foul of the British dominance of the idea of natural theology. And this is that we're created perfect, so we must therefore be the product of an intelligent mind. And he fell foul of his own colleagues in the form of a man called Georges Cuvier, who was his colleague in Paris. Now, Cuvier didn't believe in evolution. Cuvier believed that species came into existence de novo in the form that we see today. They could go extinct, but they didn't evolve. So poor Lamarck had a really hard time of life. In fact, he died blind and poor, despite having made many uh, seminal contributions to natural history in terms of taxonomy and species relations. He was so poor, in fact, or his family were so poor, they had to ask the academy for money to bury him. And he was buried in a rented grave, believe it or not, and he was dug up subsequently, and his bones are somewhere who knows where, in the Paris catacombs, probably. Most curiously, Cuvier, gave the eulogy at his funeral. And Stephen Gould, another great evolutionary biologist of recent years, remarked that it was the most deprecatory and chillingly partisan biography he'd ever read. So even in death, they couldn't leave poor Lamarck alone. So you can look at that and say, well then, why are we interested in Lamarck now? 200 years have gone by. What is the interest in, in this man and his life? And the answer to that is not his linear concept of evolution, it was the fact that he proposed a mechanism. And his mechanism was that there's an integral involvement between the individual and the environment. And in fact, the individual can adapt to that environment and pass on that characteristic to its offspring. And so why should that be so exciting to us today? It's very non-Darwinian. What would be exciting about it, if there were some grounds to think that this would work, is that it would allow a more rapid evolutionary process than we currently think is possible. But what we've found recently through the study of epigenetics and human development is this does happen in a form, not quite the way Lamarck had it in mind, but close enough for us to be able to think again about Lamarck's theories. So it turns out that when you're developing as an embryo, you read your mother's condition. You take a cue from her internal state to predict what the environment is going to be like when you're born. So if you imagine your genome is a big blueprint, how we'd conventionally think about that blueprint, blueprint is there are dominant recessive genes and that determines who you are. No, it turns out your blueprint is covered with switches. 
These have terms like methylation sites and histone modification, but they're just like little switches. So when you're developing as that embryo, you're listening to your mother's condition and you're setting the switches. This is a fantastic plastic way, it's called soft evolution, of pre-adapting you to the environment you're going to be born in. It happens in other animals too, this is not uniquely human. So the um, meadow vole, for example, it can read its mother's diurnal clock and predict the season it's going to be born in. And in doing so, that will determine the length of its hair. So it insulates itself in expectations of the conditions it's going to see. Now the process can go wrong, which is a bit unfortunate, because if your, your conditions differ from your mother's, you can end up being maladapted. And we're seeing that to some extent today with people um, with problems of obesity and diabetes, where you're expecting perhaps a different nutritional state than you actually experience at your birth. But the exciting thing about it is we now know so much more about how we can tune our physiology and our phenotype, it would be called, at birth by ensuring that the conditions during development are correct. And again, it, it really accentuates the need on a global basis to ensure that we can control maternal health. What's the other exciting thing about it? Well, the exciting thing, perhaps and the most exciting thing when we think about flourishing in the 21st century is an academic working on this subject here in Southampton can publish a paper. That paper goes into the internet. It becomes globally available, provided, of course, we keep control of our governments who always seem to want to turn things off. But it becomes globally available. So now a physician in China can read that paper and he can say, oh, that's the problem I've been having with the children. And he can change the dietary uh, state of the mothers and improve the health of the next generation of Chinese children. So what we're seeing there is almost a direct inheritance. It's almost like Lamarck talked about, as though we are able to modulate generations in people who are not related to over time and over space. So for me, that's the escape from what I call the Darwinian tar pit. So if you imagine this is humanity here, and we have the mammoth in the tar pit. On top of it is us, we're the saber-toothed cat. And we're myopically eating this mammoth because it's a resource that's available to us without thinking at all about the future and the fact that we're going to get stuck in the tar as well. I'm actually an optimist, and I think with globalization and global knowledge and improved healthcare and an understanding of what makes us who we are, and some attention to controlling our biology, we'll be able to avoid this rather dire state and uh, have a flourishing 21st century. Thank you very much.